Welcome to Money Reimagined. I'm Michael Casey. This week, we're kicking off a new initiative. We're starting an ad hoc series of interviews with crypto OGs, people who've been in this space for a while and have made some significant contributions to it. We'll talk to them about their origin stories, the question of how they found their way into crypto and blockchain, and the lessons they've learned from their journey until now. We'll also seek to tap that learning and peer into the future by getting their views on where things are going for the sector. There's no set cadence for this series. We'll pepper our regular calendar of topic-driven episodes with the occasional OG piece when it fits in. But we already have some great names lined up. More on that soon. Oh, and we're open to suggestions too. You know where to find me and Sheila on Twitter with ideas. I'm at Mike J. Casey, and she is at Sheila underscore Warren. But just please, please don't pitch us your favorite coin project that you're convinced is going to the moon. We get quite a few of those as it is. Anyway, for the inaugural episode of this series, we are honored to be joined by someone who truly embodies the concept of an OG. Austin Hill, a serial entrepreneur, investor, and all-round big thinker, is perhaps best known to people in Bitcoin circles as the first CEO of Blockstream. But his roots in this industry go much deeper. In fact, they go right back to the before times, to the age before Bitcoin existed. With his Montreal-based startup Zero Knowledge Systems in the 90s, Austin was a trailblazer in taking some of the emerging new cryptographic concepts such as Zero Knowledge Proofs and was building business models around them to enable the use and sharing of reliable data in a privacy-protected environment. As anyone familiar with the story of Satoshi Nakamoto knows, these concepts were the heart and soul of the cypherpunk movement that laid the groundwork for Bitcoin, which Satoshi first introduced to the world via the legendary cypherpunk mailing list. I think Austin would proudly bear the label cypherpunk to describe his beginnings in this space, but let's have him talk to that particular origin story and how it brought him to Bitcoin, to Blockstream, and to his current investing strategies, and to some of the very big ideas he has on how to fix a badly broken world. But before we do, let's say hello to my co-host, Sheila Warren. Hi, Sheila. Hey, Michael. So uh, regular viewers uh, and listeners to our podcast would know that we had Austin on the show during Consensus. We had a special uh, ESG series looking at solutions to big kind of global problems around you know, mm -hmm. environment, social and governance issues. And Austin was there to talk about the vulnerable world hypothesis, which I got to say is a very, to me, a very scary concept. He's coming at it and we'll talk to him later about it, about how do we uh, actually address this and get around the, the vulnerable world hypothesis. But this idea that we're sort of almost doomed by some uh, process that is going to lead us into a very difficult world uh, was kind of scary. I don't know what, what your thoughts were on it. Well, I certainly agree. I mean, I think it's taking the idea of unintended consequences and dialing it up to 11, you know, and kind of saying there's an inevitability there uh, that if we don't factor in these unintended consequences and how they might interact with each other and scale, uh, we're going to get to a very bad place indeed. Um, what I do take heart from, and we touched on this a bit in that earlier episode, was the idea that with the right governance in place, and again, you know, I'm a governance junkie, so of course I picked up on that thread, uh, there is there is hope, you know, there is a, a chance at least, or a, a, a slim thread that we could actually wend our way uh, and find a way to, to wrangle with this concept of a vulnerable world uh, in a way that may not lead to, you know, doom and gloom and, and destruction and... <laughs> All of the above, all of the the apocalypse that seem we seem to be living in, and or, or certainly anticipating at the moment with everything going on in the world. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to chatting to Austin about it because I think I think it, you're right. It's coming to how, how do we actually figure out models by which, as a society, we can live and thrive together uh, without those without models that ultimately become self destructive. So, so Austin, on that note, why don't we bring you in? Good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. Now, um, why don't we start off from those beginnings? As, we, as I said in the monologue at the beginning, you know, you have these very early uh, OG roots in, you know, at least by, by many of our standards who came into this later in the whole, you know, cypherpunk cryptography world. Actually, why don't you just pull your t-shirt up? Because I think that's kind of useful thing to see. <laughs> so don't trust verify. Many in this space will have heard that. I only found out just now that you guys... <laughs> You and Adam Back, also from Blockstream, obviously, 
coined that phrase. Can you tell, tell us a little bit of history of that first and then we'll get, I'll, I'll throw my next question at you. Um, well, obviously we were thinking of various taglines and uh, you know, one of the core concepts with both cryptography and blockchains is this idea that you don't, you, you're able to verify a set of facts or a state or the model of a system, or at least verify to whatever degree it's open source and you can verify the code and you can verify the cryptography. There is some sort of sovereignty in the idea of, can I trust this system? Uh, and that obviously scales at different la layers. I personally don't read crypto code anymore. Um, you know, I was never actually a fully cryptographer. I was more just, I had a, a better, be good enough understanding that I could hire the top cryptographers and sit in a room with them and understand the design of a system and then design business models to support their work. Um, so, you know, if you show me a crypto algorithm, I'm not going to be able to verify it, but I can turn to Adam Back and cryptographers like Greg Maxwell and others and say, is this algorithm proven? Is there an actual form of proof? And so if software is using this properly and has been tested, especially at the level that Bitcoin and uh, the core, Bitcoin core community does code verification and has a very high security threshold, it allows us to say, okay, we can trust this system and we don't have to trust it. We can actually verify some formal properties of it. And uh, that it was a very cool idea that we felt really embodied Bitcoin mm. was, you know, which al also is very different from a lot of other coins where, you know, there is a centralization feature. You can't run a full node. And so it really just, it, it, we loved the tagline. It was obviously a play on Reagan's old adage, uh, trust but verify. Uh, and trust implies some kind of mistaken faith in something. Whereas, you know, the idea that uh, you have sovereignty, financial sovereignty, code sovereignty, open source sovereignty implies more that you don't have to trust. You have mechanisms of verification. Okay. Um, so, so taking that, like, why don't we look back in the, in the 90s? Tell us a little bit about zero knowledge systems. And, you know, it was taking some of these ideas then pre-Bitcoin, thinking about how math and code could build these levels of, of verification to enable society. But it seems to me that back then, you know, not that many people really had a good grasp of what was at stake, right? Now there's a much bigger conversation around the loss of privacy, the, the abuse of centralized systems and the data honeypots that they, you know, we had last week, we were talking about Adar, and, you know, in India and the biometric data, data honeypot that they have. Now there's this big conversation around it, but back in the nineties, I think people were just like, wow, the internet, this is cool. You know, you were already thinking about this. Tell us about that realization and where you thought it was going and what zero knowledge systems was trying to do and actually what you did achieve. Sure. So uh, in the beginning of the early nineties, I was kind of a white hat hacker in my teenage years. I started a security consulting company where I would do uh, penetration attacks on behalf of companies that was kind of one of my first companies. And so uh, when in the mid 90s, there was Operation Sun Devil, um, where the FBI cracked down and arrested a number of hackers and in many cases, uh, you know, infringed on their civil rights uh, and kind of demonized a bunch of uh, teenage hackers who were just exploring technology. Um, there was a lot of fear mongering going on around encryption and the Clipper Wars had begun where the government was trying to do key escrow. Um, so uh, I was a big fan of the work of John Perry Barlow, Mitch Kapoor, and John Gilmore, who started the EFF. And John Gilmore was obviously a co-founder of the cypherpunk movement. So uh, I was on the cypherpunk list back in the mid-90s, uh, where there was a lot of theorization about what are the tools of uh, cryptography that might give us some freedoms back. And there was this kind of very myopic dream world uh, done by Tim May and uh, people like Ian, Dr. Ian Goldberg and Adam Back talking about, could we use the internet to regain freedoms that we're losing in real life? Freedom of speech, sovereignty of identity, the idea of privacy. And some of those technologies that were being talked about were things like PipeNet from WayDi, which was a variation on David Sholmes' DC Nets, which actually forms the basis of how Tor works. Why did I that also invented an early uh, an early cryptocurrency, right? But the just yeah, did, 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 did money. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so these were kind of um, my peers, and we hung out on this list, and we would theorize about what would be the elements 
of a digital privacy infrastructure. Um, and we broke it down into kind of three separate layers. One was at the network layer, you wanted to have total privacy. So you weren't leaking data, your IP address, you could have uh, protect against like cookie leakage. And so the idea was kind of some sort of desktop firewall that would route all your packets through some privacy infrastructure. And so we built something called the Freedom Network, which had layered uh, encryption, similar to what onion routing uh, became. And we kind of mm. collaborated. Adam Back did some of the first formal threat models. There's research papers. And we were big fans of security through transparency. So we actually published white papers showing all the different ways our system could be attacked. Um, the next layer was identity. Could you have pseudonymous identities where you had persistent identities for different aspects of your life? If you were discussing healthcare in a Usenet form, uh, you wouldn't link it back to your real identity. So you could have unique emails that were totally untraceable and could not be linked to you. And we focused on pseudonymity rather than pure anonymity because of some issues on uh, iterative prisoner's dilemma and game theory around if you have pure anonymity, there's generally a race to the bottom of you know trolling and negative behavior. Whereas if you have persistent pseudonymity, people kind of invest in a persistent identity, but that doesn't have to be linked to your true identity. And that was kind of where the concept of zero knowledge, and that was building off the work of tons of people in the cypherpunk community who actually built NIM servers that would protect your identity for posting because you know one of the very early cases was the Church of Scientology sued a Dutch remailer and forced them to reveal the identities when they were going mm. after detractors. Oh. And this was a non.pennant.fi and was kind of a famous internet Great case. Great use case. They, yeah, re yeah, really uh, clear, clear point there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, litigious individuals using what now is protected against slap suits were using litigation to mm. harass and go after detractors. And sometimes these were me mem members of the press. Sometimes these were civil libertarians. Um, one of the earliest uses of our uh, freedom network was human rights workers in Bosnia doing a data analysis on the refugees leaving. And they actually used our software and Palm Pilots to be able to report from the field real data. And they were, had to hide themselves. And they ended up testifying in uh, Milosevic's trial at The Hague. So, wow. I mean, there is real yeah, use real, cases. Very useful yeah. stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this you know, wasn't just criminals. Yeah, it's it's you know it's interesting. I think uh, just for a little bit of context from our from our listeners and viewers, you know, uh, if you think about the early days of cryptography, it was really uh, largely relegated to the military spy agencies. There's a whole host of you know uh, streaming video I'm sure that talks about some of the code breakers and whatnot. You know, where, which people are kind of familiar with and have a romantic kind of uh, imagination about. But uh, the the cypherpunks were really an early group that recognized that cryptography was both a sword and a shield that could be used to protect against invasions of privacy by government or other actors on a more or less nefarious spectrum, uh, but also understood uh, that they could be protective. Like it could be protective. It could also be kind of a we weaponized by these actors to kind of, uh, in some of the cases that Austin you're talking about, to obtain information that really uh, was going to violate civil liberties or put people's lives very much in danger. And there's just a really clear, just to kind of belabor this point, very clear thread, clear through to today, where you can kind of see how a lot of the messaging around Bitcoin is that it is a way of protecting activists and others. We had the episode where we talked about what's happening in Sudan with Sudan Huddle and Alice Gladstein, talking about how activists are actually using uh, Bitcoin as a way to stay off the radar in some ways of oppressive actors. But at the exact same time, those very same actors are also using Bitcoin as a way to uh, basically go after you know, some of these folks and to, to do um, and, uh, other things like that are maybe not as, as, as pro-social in their, in their orientation. So it's just uh, the reason why we're so excited about this series in part is because the roots of a lot of what we're wrestling with today go way back before Satoshi's white paper, as Michael noted, before Bitcoin all the way back, you know, to the, to the eighties and the early nineties, um, when a lot of this activity was really getting, getting started and really starting to grow. Um, the thing I think that's, that's also really interesting, Austin, that I, I'd love to ask you about is, you know, it, your encounter with Bitcoin, you're for the first time you actually encountered, read the white paper, <laughs> heard about it, like how you saw that fitting into the things that you were already very passionate about, whether they were, you know, cypherpunks or other things that you were 
you were uh, dealing with as kind of this white hat hacker and in the, in the role that you were, you saw yourself being in? Sure. I'm going to back into it very quickly because the last aspect when we talked about the three layers that Zero Knowledge tried was going to be electronic cash because you couldn't have a pseudonym and you couldn't be anonymous or pseudonymous online if you had to pull out a credit card to pay for everything. And this was still at the dawn of the internet and people were terrified of entering their credit card. Privacy was actually talked about extensively and all over the news. Mm. And so uh, we believed that you had to have all three elements. And so we ultimately hired some of the world's top cryptographers. We had 240 employees. We set up in Canada where we could bypass US export controls on crypto. Um, and we were very aspirational, had tons of dreams. So we, uh, DigiCash, which had the patents for what was known as one of the few ways to do electronic cash was in bankruptcy. We tried to buy the patents to set them free. We were gonna open source the patents to spur an innovation. We were denied the acquisition. And so we hired the only other inventor of uh, the patents which is part of the reason at Blockstream and many of the work we do, we're so against patents because patents held up the development of crypto, both RSA's patents and the DigiCash patents were locked up by uh, in very restrictive licenses. And so we hired uh, Dr. Stefan Brands and that was the only other way of doing electronic cash. And we actually were the only people operating a token server that would let you buy things with anonymous eCash. And it was to buy our NIMS. But it wasn't a scalable open system. We were licensing our eCash toolkit to Nokia and to a bunch of people trying to do eCash projects. And then the dot-com crash happened. Uh, and obviously having raised you know, $80 million and having 250 employees and trying to do too much, we had to learn, take our chops and it was very painful. So I had to fire a bunch of employees. We scaled from 250 employees back down to 70 and as part of that, we had to throw away a lot of the beautiful crypto dreams and research that a lot of the company was founded on and transition. And ultimately, we learned a very painful lesson. And I joked about this. Bruce Schneider actually kind of borrowed this quote. If you get 100 people and ask them about privacy, and if they care, 98% will hold up their hand. If you uh, find them on five days later, and ask them if they're willing to exchange uh, their DNA in exchange for a year free Big Macs. 95 will put up their hand, um, which is just a very unfortunate, uh, you know, but true statement in the sense that uh, privacy is this ephemeral idea that everyone has different concepts of it. They have a hard time assessing what does it mean and they make bad choices day by day. For many years, the same was true of the environment. Do you care about the environment? Yes. Why are you driving a large SUV? Because it's so convenient. <laughs> Um, and so the actions don't know. And so that made the market for privacy very difficult. And people didn't know the difference between buying Norton Internet Security or McAfee's Internet Suite, which was more security than privacy and privacy. And so fast forward to 2010, um, I had moved on. I was doing venture capital. We had transitioned zero knowledge into a company called Radio Point had a successful exit, we grew revenue and became very profitable, but not doing the stuff that I was so passionate about. And so I moved on to doing some venture capital, uh, you know, helping do angel investments. And so in 2010, I started getting phone calls from friends, ex-employees saying, Austin, you really got to check out this Bitcoin. Uh, it looks like someone finally cracked the code. And frankly, my adage, at that point, I was kind of going through a, a midlife career, you know, I had done nothing but startups for 20 years. I, I had left the tech industry to go play poker professionally. Um, I had uh, My goal was not to open my inbox for three months at a time, at least. Um, <laughs> and so when they started calling me and saying, you got to check out this Bitcoin thing, my first response was, I'm glad someone figured it out, but I already spent $8 million trying to crack this code. I really don't want to go back and experience any bad memories. <laughs> I was kind of dealing with the, the trauma. You had a trauma there. response. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that, that was my first response at the beginning. I was like, I'm glad someone figured it out, but I'm not looking to rush back into this. And it wasn't until 2013, um, the price was still at a couple hundred. Adam had just come back from the uh, big uh, U.S. Bitcoin conference. I think it was in Vegas or, uh, and he 
he was he started calling me and he's like, Austin, we can't ignore this. This is really the realization of all of our dreams. And it looks like one system is finally getting to scale. It's bootstrapped. It's different than what we know because it doesn't have the same privacy properties, but it's so resilient because of its peer-to-peer -peer nature. And it has all these other properties that we never solved. Sound money, monetary sovereignty policy, uh, the resilience that comes from being peer-to-peer. -peer. All systems we had theorized, um, but we no one put all the pieces together. You know, Nick Zabo had some elements. There were elements of it in B Money. Um, Adam Back and people on the cypherpunk mailing list theorized uh, Hashcash was designed as a postage meter system to deal with payment online, but the inflation control systems that the difficulty rate solved just hadn't been factored in. So, you know, the combination of all of these that was the genius of the work of Satoshi and the work of the early open source community that got it to scale finally had this breakthrough. And so uh, I first ignored Adam. I was like, Adam, I'm still retired. <laughs> he, he thankfully did not give up. Hey, so, I, I just want to I just want to point out as well the timing of that implies that neither you nor Adam are Satoshi because uh, <laughs> right, because yes. you know uh, you know unless That's unless Adam's you know coming at you our... from a, from a different perspective but I mean Anyone we know that we know we, let's just put that on the table we know that conversation is out there a lot but let's uh, you know just saying Ever just saying seen me write any code will swear by my inability to be Satoshi oh, yeah. I, I I've never actually <laughs> thought it was you Austin Adam on the other hand. Yeah. Adam Adam has been on the record. I know for a fact, I know what he was doing at the time. He had just sold a company uh, called PyCorp to EMC, and he was one of their top cryptographers. Um, and sometimes when you sell a company and you have share vesting and you're trying to do work, you get distracted. You're not, but you know, he had looked at Bitcoin. He did some mm -hmm. early mining. Um, it just wasn't his all encompassing passion because he had just sold PyCorp. Um, you know, which, you know, so, you know, life t sometimes gets in, the, you know, Adam has children, he has a life, he was working on another startup. Um, so everyone's like, how could you have ignored it? And it's like, you know, th there were 10 other eCash systems that got proposed and came and went and never got to scale. So, uh, and a number of the original cypherpunks, even Tim May commented before he passed on how Bitcoin fails on so many of the privacy aspirations that we were shooting for. Yeah, and so he, he it, wrote a, a long rant for CoinDesk, yes. and I encourage yes. our readers to go and search. Can I actually set that up? I know I, I had conversations with Tim yeah. before he died as well, and said, "Please write something for us." And it was just a classic Tim May rant. Encourage our readers look up uh -oh. Timothy May and CoinDesk. I, I, I was on the receiving end of some of Tim May rants. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. When we met with him, when we were starting with zero knowledge, he was like, "Okay, it seems like you're doing a lot of good things, but just know." that if you were to ever insert a backdoor in your system, I would view it as part of my moral right to end you. And I was like, thank you so much for your blessing and wow. approval, Tim. <laughs> but we became really good friends. I loved him. I'm sad to see his voice and his inspiration leave us. Um, but so uh, it was really in the Q4 of 2013 that Adam thankfully refused to give up. He flew to Montreal. He said, Austin, I'm taking you for coffee. He goes, I've got all these ideas that I've been talking to people in core about how to do things like confidential transactions, mm -hmm. how to provide upgrade mechanisms to Bitcoin through this kind of idea of a two-way peg and side chains. He goes, but this stuff isn't going to happen by accident. None of these open source developers are getting support. They mm -hmm. all work at like Netscape. They work for free nights and weekends. They work at Google. Um, I, you know, he, he asked me, he said, can you come out of retirement and help me raise some money and help fund and put together the team? And within a week, I had gone through the Bitcoin rabbit hole. I didn't sleep. I read everything that had ever been published. I uh, fell in love with everything that was happening. And uh, in January, I flew to Malta. Adam and I sat in a hotel room and mapped out how we saw the ecosystem growing, what the scarcity in the ecosystem was, and how to design Blockstream in such a way that we would not be our own worst enemy in the system. So we designed things like uh, morality clauses on the contract. So any of the core developers had the right to resign and we had this massive payout. It was almost like a poison pill that could destroy the company if we ever were being uh, evil or destroying, like fighting the system. Um, we talked about which investors we would take money from 
who understood what we were trying to do. So like Reed Hoffman, who was very involved with Firefox and purposely funded and supported Mozilla so that we wouldn't just have a Google and Microsoft and Apple version of browsers, understood open source models. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew Reed previously and uh, trusted him incredibly. Um, and you know, of note, he did the investment personally and not through his venture fund because he understood that we may spend five years before we understood how to make money. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we literally said we're gonna be open source and there's only a few open source business models that tend to work. And we didn't see any of them really working in Bitcoin. So um, I, wanna, I wanna pick up on this, I, I, sorry, sorry, because I, 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 I want you to keep going with it. So keep, this, this narrative is great, Austin. I'm just gonna keep, every now and then I'm gonna bump in and just like Jason, this because I was lucky enough to have, I think the exclusive interview with, maybe it was you and Reed. It certainly had Reed and I think you were there. Maybe it was Adam and Reed, I wish my memory was better than this, but right at the very beginning when Blockstream, and I was at the journal, and you guys reached out and said, Alex Fowler, and we, I chatted to him. And I remember at the time, like asking Reed, you know, how are you going to make money, right? What is, you know, and, and he did, he emphasized the idea that this was a part of the personal investment because it wouldn't have the same demands that a VC model would have for his, for his investors. And he could sit back and wait and see what you guys are going to do. And it was, it seemed to me, and I want you to sort of tell me whether I'm getting this right, but it was just like, we don't know, <laughs> but we know that we need to, fund the development of this open source software uh, in some way, because without it, the, the business models won't arise. And therefore I've got to, we've got to see this happen. And then, you know, side chains and ideas like that were seen as models upon which something would be built in the future. Is, is that fair to say, well, or did you feel like you had yeah, a, a clear so, idea of exactly what your, what your go to market strategy was going to be? So I, I definitely don't want to put words in Reed's mouth. Uh, he wrote a very incredible blog post talking about his inspirations. Um, most of the investors we spoke to were all holders of Bitcoin. Um, they had made money off the internet uh, in various ways. Um, I knew them for years and had relationships as an entrepreneur and VC. Um, and so we were very selective. We only went to like seven or eight firms that we showed initially the core deal to. And we said in our presentation, we said, listen, we don't know exactly which mix of elements we will make money from. We know we want to decentralize mining. And so we may do mining and there's ways to make money in Bitcoin and money. Um, we may, some of these side chains may have some unique revenue sources like asset issuance. Um, it was kind of, I'll tell you a funny story from the fundraising. <laughs> um, so we actually got the offer off just a napkin. Uh, and finally, once I got term sheets, just I had a lot of experience pitching. I ran a pitch school in Montreal where I trained 300 entrepreneurs on how to pitch. Um, so, um, but finally, when we went to do the final presentation, uh, a number of investors said, please put together a deck, Austin. Just have something visual that we can look at. <laughs> and so I finally threw together a deck, and there is this one add a part of the pitch where I said, I kind of preemptive, it was kind of funny. It was a tongue in cheek joke, but I was like, okay, everyone asked about market size. I said, one adage I know from teaching entrepreneurs and working with them is every entrepreneur always lies about market size. They say, if I only get 1% of the 2 billion people, the market's going to be huge. And I said, we all know that's not how you build market size. You build it bottom up where you say, how many customers can I talk to in year one? How many can I reach in year three? How much are each of those customers worth? I said, that being said, I'm very proud to tell you that our market size is $15 quadrillion. <laughs> and then there's obviously this massive laugh. <laughs> and then people are like, you know, I can't believe the chutzpah on this guy that he comes in and tells us his market <laughs> is 15 quadrillion. But then I showed them, I said, how much is all the money in the world right. worth? Yep. How much is remaking? And you would go through and say, you know, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange just did six quadrillion dollars in yep. equity assets. That's one market. The total asset, you know, money for, you know, sound money uh, mm -hmm. and gold, the m money for payment networks, the money for international. And you start, you start adding it up and you say, we have no clue <laughs> yeah, how yeah. we're going to earn any part of that. <laughs> but it is a big addressable market. <laughs> we said, but one of the most experienced teams who have done work on a, a very rare technology 
And I said, if you could go back to the 1980s or the early 1990s and invest in one of 30 people who knew how to run the internet, would you do that? Because out of that emerged Sun Microsystems and Cisco. And we kind of viewed ourselves as com comparable because both Sun and Cisco focused on open source protocols and open source technologies where they did tons of work at the IETF. They invested in these open protocols and they, they also built hardware that wasn't proprietary. Anyone could build a router supporting TCP IP. They just built the best ones. And so our approach was always, we will never do anything closed source, never do anything proprietary, even liquid that we run as a side chain, which is run by a federation, all the code is published. Anyone can build a competing version of liquid. And the real hard work is assembling a federation and partners. So that has always been the guiding principle of Blockstream. Uh, and so a lot of the conspiratorial, oh, you're the Illuminati and you took over Bitcoin, um, you know, every company has its detractors, but we're very proud of saying we came in um, and focused on funding for core developers and focused on a set of principles that we felt Bitcoin uh, needed. And we would you know, fight very hard for those beliefs, decentralization, open source. Um, and that's not to say you know, mistakes aren't made at a startup. You cannot be part of a startup without you know, running into a whole bunch of, you know, I can look back and say, I wish I would have done this differently. I wish we would have you know, not hired this person or hired five more like this person. But I'm really, really proud of the work that the team and Adam has done, and they deserve tons of credit because they really have stuck to those principles and I think done some good for the ecosystem. So it, it's, I mean, it's an interesting way to think about it because you did end up leaving Blockstream, um, you know, yeah. and I, I know, you know, I know probably you wanted to stick it out longer. I, I don't, you know, if you want to go to the details of how and why, but seems to me, and this is my understanding of it, right? In those early days, you know, that struggle to figure out how you were going to make money was very real. And, and now, of course, just this yeah. past week, you know, Blockstream's just raised 210 million, it's valued at 3 billion. Um, you know, things are clicking around liquid and other things, but like it was a, you were finding your way in those early days. Can well, you talk a little bit about that struggle that you had and, you know, as, as the CEO responsible, albeit Reed had given you some space, but you, you nonetheless had to deliver on something that was going to be profitable. That right? pressure wasn't so strong. So we raised okay. $21 million as a seed. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who understand venture economics, oftentimes mm -hmm. people are like, oh, you, you now have slave masters. No, we, we managed to raise money and I've raised enough money and uh, you can manage a cap table such that, uh, you know, Adam and ourselves and the other co-founders who were all, you know, significant equity owners, we had a majority of the company. We had no one who had dominating control. We shared interest with investors because you know every time you bring an investor in, you want them to be aligned and sometimes they get board seats. But in no way does taking on an outside investor mean you lose control of your company unless you're doing a horrible job as an, as an entrepreneur and you have to do a massive down round. Um, very quickly after we raised the 21 million, we still had a big amount of that in the bank and I saw the writing on the wall. I talked with our board and we said, you know, this was now kind of mid, mid to uh, end of 2014 uh, when the Bitcoin's price was still quite high and there was a lot of excitement around blockchain. Uh, money was flowing in. And just in being uh, prudent, I was kind of like, you know what, a year from now when we may need the money, we have no guarantee that the getting is going to still be good. Mm -hmm. we might be in a very different market environment. And so with the consultation of my board, I went out and did another fundraising. And if you've ever done a fundraising, it is to do it right is very intense. It takes a lot of effort. You're on the road usually for at least 60 to 90 days. And we went and raised another 55 million, not because we were out of money, but we realistically looked and said, it could be four to five or six years before we actually figure out a business model and we want lots of gas in the tank so that we don't have that pressure. So we're not scrambling to be forced to do things that compromise our value or that, you know, just because we have to earn a buck. And so a uh, combination of that, um, originally we were going to have a big headquarters in Montreal and I really wanted the team to come together and live together in one location but a lot of the team was so used to open source and really loved the idea of being decentralized. 
And that was really new for me as a CEO. I wanted to see my team. I like wanted the, you know, some t- uh, team bonding and gel um, where we were so engineering focused and they were used to just hanging out in IRC. I had never managed a team on IRC. <laughs> and to be honest, that was causing me some angst when I was leave- living in hotels and trying to organize <laughs> Some yeah. of the most brilliant engineers in the world. I remember being stunned that a lot of the early guys had never met each other at all. Yeah. Yep. You know, yeah. Well, fast forward to DAOs now, right? So it's again, well, and, the parallels are just so interesting, but yeah. And so this was very new. And so, you know, I found myself uh, in 2015 and the first part of 2016, I had spent all of 20 days in my hometown, in my uh, home. I was living out of hotels. I was, you know, and I had told investors from day one that I wanted to transition at one point and hire a great CEO um, because I saw my role more in biz dev and raising capital. And I I really loved what Reed had done at LinkedIn where he essentially hired his own CEO and became a product manager because he loved product. Um, And uh, so it was kind of a mix of that, that at a certain point, I just was looking at my health, to be honest. I had put on tons of weight. Um, I think as a CEO, you have to be fit to lead um, and you have to lead by example. Um, And I just looked at it and I was like, you know what? I came out of a retirement to do something. I've done it. I've set up a team with tons of capital. I brought on some of the best investors. I've equipped them with multiple years of runway. And so in consultation with Adam, thankfully he stepped up and was willing to be CEO. And I said, guys, I'm just gonna, I'm, I need some time off. I wanna work on other parts of my life. And so that was really the kind of source of discussion. Um, it's never easy. You know, I think a lot of investors wanted me to stay longer and in a different set of environments I would have, um, but it was much better for me. It was much better for my happiness. And um, ultimately I'm really thankful for to Adam and the team that stuck around and worked hard in building what they do. And so I still consult with them and I'm there supporting mm. in any way I can. Austin, I love that story. I think it's such a powerful story about really uh, looking at the values that you were trying to build into this company and that you committed to and looking in your own life and saying, am I mirroring those values in a way that's going to be uh, that, where I can lead this, this team kind of into that? Or am I, am I providing the right kind of balance and space that I need for myself? And I, I can't help but just think about the current time we're in, you know, where we're seeing this like massive exit of the workforce by a variety of <laughs> people taking different roles or just exiting altogether uh, as a result of, of being forced to take that kind of stock. So uh, just, you know, yeah. really uh, entrepreneurship to do that yeah. in context, right? It's very hard when you're moving on, when you're on such a fast train to kind of take that, take the stock of that. But one thing I want to talk about is in addition to your prescience around that kind of thing, um, Side chains. So we, we've touched on this a little bit, but you know, side chains are of course now a big part of what uh, of, of Wall Street's value prop and model. Uh, but at the time that you're talking about, that was really radical. I, I mean, we were still kind of you know, establishing core, right? And so to this idea that side chains were going to be something that was going to rise in importance and prominence and decentralize side chains, nonetheless. Say a little bit more about that and, and how you yeah. came upon that idea and, and, and a little more. It certainly that. wasn't mine. It was Adam. Adam originally had proposed this idea of improvements on the privacy model and the fungibility of Bitcoin through some homomorphic encryption that's used in confidential transactions that lets you hide the value and the asset type. Um, and in working with a bunch of the core developers, you realize that Bitcoin does not adopt those changes easily. Um, it's very slow to move. It's slow to upgrade <laughs> by design. Yep. And then we had the block size debate, which we'll get to in a moment. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Prove that point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I do have to say that some of the some of the toxicity and some of the religious wars and some of the toll that that takes. I mean, every industry has it, but Bitcoin t- takes everything and dials it up to 100. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, certainly the block size wars, you know, uh, some people had a lot of just kind of resilience to it. It amazes me, Adam. He grew up around internet trolls on the cypherpunk list, and he was just able to turn the volume down. I saw, you know, our employees getting death threats. There were Bitcoin yeah. bounties put on their head. I saw employees in the hospital, um, and I took it personally. Like, and part of that was my own mental state. Um, so it's given me some perspective on, you know, how to manage and separate yourself from some of that toxicity. I certainly like, I don't spend time on crypto Twitter anymore. I have no interest. Um, 
you know, I appreciate some aspects of it, but in some ways, you know, I view some of that toxicity almost to be self-defeating. Um, but if you look at the side chains idea, um, we did a bunch of work. So we flew in uh, as we were creating the company, a whole bunch of the core developers and cryptographers that had some of the best understanding of core. And we did some initial uh, assessments to say, okay, could this side chain work? Could a two-way peg mathematically work? Um, wh how does the math work? And once we, we understood it enough that we were able to say, we're 80 to 90% sure this will work. Um, to be honest, there are some elements of that that are still not fully built out. Even in liquid, it's a federated peg. Right. Um, so even though it's an M of N signature where you have multiple signatures and trust is in, in one entity, it's still not entirely a trustless peg. Um, and there are some attempts to do trustless pegs. Uh, I mean, Paul Stork has drive chains. Um, the you know people at Roostock are using a variation. Um, but the, there are some interesting, unique threat model and attacks around uh, you know merge mining, and which was the concept of how we would get a massive amount of hash rate around a side chain. But if you issue side assets on a, a merge mine side chain, and let's say you were to issue all the real estate on the in the world, <laughs> or you were to, to issue an identity server where the nation state threat model is, okay, we, ne we need to find out who this whistleblower is. We'll spend ungodly amounts of money. You introduce a threat that is a non-economic threat to the core chain because you're incentivizing people to build up hash rate to attack potentially a minority side chain hash rate, but then they can get combined to com attack the main chain. And so there's these all really kind of nuanced attacks that you could say, a fully trustless two-way peg still is unsolved computer science. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no value in what's being done. Um, and that was only one part. I mean, we funded for years um, work on the Lightning Protocol, uh, along with uh, you know the incredible work by Lightning Labs and some of the other players, um, because we understood Lightning was great for scalability and helped support decentralization. And we had no profit motive in that. We were just kind of like, we had no idea if you could make money with lightning, but it was all, we just viewed it as our And work. that's why, and that, just to be, just to make that a little point clear, because you were big backers of Segwit, obviously. In fact, you, you know, yeah. your own staff were helping to code that. Um, and was that the motive then? Like, I mean, it was always like, well, what is it? What's, what's in Segwit for Blockstream? It was really actually to sort of enable layer two solutions like, like lightning, well, I suppose, right? So there was a combination. So uh, the, Transaction malleability bug was a bug in Bitcoin that no one knew how to fix, mm. that allowed you to do certain attacks. Uh, I mean, Mt. Gox mistakenly blamed it on their attack. It was not real. But you could forge uh, signatures and do transaction malleability attacks. Now, if you wait enough blocks, you can get past it. But one of the side effects of this was that you could not properly do locked up ch uh, payment channels. Now, Lightning... Uh, people like to view talk about SegWit and Lightning as some like new innovation that hacked Bitcoin's core purpose. But in fact, Satoshi had put payment channels in. Um, originally, Mike Hearn and Bluemat had coded payment channels, mm -hmm. and it was the incredible work of you know the original Lightning uh, white paper, not yeah. ours. Mm -hmm. It's open source. Tad Dreiger is uh, yeah. yeah. Tash, he yeah. said, "Oh, uh, aside from a two-way payment channel." where you and I can rebalance and we can leave this channel open. And we don't have to send a transaction each time. I can lock up funds, you can lock up funds and we can just run, you know, essentially an open net settlement layer where at the end of the day, we'll do net settlement and decide which transaction. That was part yeah. of the original Bitcoin protocol. It was, yeah. you know, the payment protocol, uh, you know, channel. Um, and so it was already seen as a way to reduce transaction block size use. It was just Taj who came up and said, you know what? You could use this concept to do multi-routing where it's not just person to person and you could actually build a very extensive layer two. Yeah. And we saw that and said, that's worth investing in because mm -hmm. that can really help us maintain decentralization, not have to increase the block size. But the one thing missing was, oh, we need SegWit. Mm. And, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's a lot of resilience against doing hard forks uh, in Bitcoin, because every time you do a hard fork, 
you introduce a massive risk to not only like long-term locked up funds, uh, you open a pressure point that a government or a hostile coder could come and insert mm. code or backdoors or could come and say, oh, we noticed you did six hard forks last year. Here's a national security warrant that says next time you do a hard fork, please add this patch. Nice. And most companies don't even know how to do canary warrants. You know, we saw with Google and Apple that they were forced to do things against their will. Uh, and, at, you know, so the threat model, every time you do a hard fork, is to the entire ecosystem. Wow. Um, and so, by, mm -hmm. yeah, and by, by having soft forks where you can have backwards compatibility, mm -hmm. there is this incredible uh, preference for those types of upgrades. Uh, but no one had figured out how to do that. And so when uh, it was originally proposed by Luke Dash Jr., he said, oh, by the way, here's how a way you could get SegWit in. It would al allow progressive versioning on soft forks because we could add versioning. So it makes every other upgrade possible. And we get this incredible SegWit solution, which could allow us to do lightning. Mm -hmm. And so it really was... There were a lot of people who were considering doing like 248, uh, responding to the work of Gavin and Mike Kern, who were screaming to do Bitcoin XT at eight meg megabits. Mm -hmm. uh, and the block size wars were going very intensely. And when Core came out and said, hey, by the way, we, we think we figured out a best of both worlds. We can add block size, we can increase it with SegWit, we solve a major vulnerability, and we get the foundation upon which to do improvements. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I often compare this, do you think about like the invention of the airplane and you go back and say, okay, the airplane's invented and a bunch of engineers do a bunch of work to make sure the airplanes are very safe. And you have one most popular version of an airplane, let's call it a 747. And let's say someone owns the domain name airplane.com and is an incredible marketer. I won't say who I'm thinking of, um, but they sell tons of airplane tickets. And they start screaming and saying, you know what? I'm running out of room on the airplane. I can't sell enough tickets. And I understand economics. So please add a bunch of seats to the wing, add a bunch of flop down seats and start adding 400 more passengers to the airplane. And the engineers say, you know what? Hold on. We care about the industry of airplane and aviation safety. We're not going to add a bunch of weight. You do not understand engineering. There's a, a safety risk if you add a bunch of passengers to the wing and add too much weight. Give us a year or two, and we'll design you a 787 or some bigger plane that's actually designed to do that. And that person says, no, no, no. I, I don't respect you engineers. I only really respect economics, and I want to sell more plane tickets. And I can sell more plane tickets, you can sell more passengers. And so you have this debate that is just totally irrational and unqualified. Why should I listen to a marketeer about how my plane is engineered? The same way I shouldn't listen to, you know, the person from Expedia on the nuclear safety conditions in a reactor. I go to a <laughs> nuclear engineer. I don't let the person from Expedia say we need more energy to fly more, you know, do more things. And our data center needs energy. So please change your settings on your nuclear reactor. Hmm. And so this is where the debate was so disingenuous in the sense that there were qualified engineers discussing real trade-offs and these are the same engineers that we rely on in civic engineering to build bridges that don't fall down. You do not have a car manufacturer saying, I'm tired of waiting online, crossing <laughs> over to New York, and yeah. we want to put more cars across the bridge. So by the way, here are the specs for a new layer to your bridge. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it, it's a great, it's a great analogy. And I think, it, I think it, I, I understand why engineers get so defensive on the, on this grounds. But then again, you said something earlier, and I'm going to use this to talk a little bit about how we move forward into a, a forward-looking conversation of what you're up to now. But first of all, before I do, I just want to say thank you for citing Taj on Lightning because he's the most unsung hero of this whole thing, right? We've now got Jack Mallers doing you know, these exciting things in El Salvador and, of course, Elizabeth Stark leading Lightning Labs. But Taj is the quietest, most underspoken guy. You know, worked with him for a couple of years at MIT and really is the genius behind a lot of this stuff. And it's A uh, lot of the engineers incredible. are. So right. many of these engineers yeah. <laughs> resorted to publishing. I mean, we saw proposals like Memble Wimble being published by you know, Harry Potter pseudonym. Right. Because they yeah. just learned that if you speak up and add your name to something, it leads to personal attacks. Yeah. And so, you know, the use of pseudonymity and the idea that uh, criticize the code, criticize the idea, don't criticize the personality behind it, yeah. became kind of a very valued principle. So, yeah, another those protective measure. Yeah. 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 
I mean, so, so like, you know, you were talking about threat models a lot, what you're talking about here. And, and, and I think what's really sort of a big, been a great learning experience for me as I've gone and sort of deeper constantly down to the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And partly because I've always been interested in macroeconomics and, and these big systems conversations <laughs> is that, yeah, once you start talking about, you know, what is at risk when you are making decisions, you realize it's not just uh, a technical issue, right? It, it is a whole set of economic considerations and, and these factors are there. And so you were talking about things like, you know, the nation state threat model as being something you have to consider as to whether or not you could lay in the side chain with, you know, X amount of value. It's no longer a question of, of the tech, really. It's like now the security of the whole system is challenged by economic incentives, right? So I sure. want to take that. I also want to take some of the stuff that you've been talking about, your own personal challenges and journeys, and as you know, thinking through what it is to be a leader of, of people and of ideas and, and driving towards the things that you care about and, and, and pull that together and just say, all right, now, you know, you and I've been chatting a bit. We had you on, on uh, the ESG show, but it came from a long conversation that you and I had late at night. I was wandering around my backyard and you were in Costa Rica and I was just like, holy, wow, what, what, you know, this is big. And, and we, we were talking about, you know, the vulnerable uh, world hypothesis and, and, and what it means and whether or not and what we could do to, to sort of encourage people to build different systems that protect us against it. So the first question is, um, explain to people what that is as quickly as you can, because we don't have a lot of time, but just to, in, in a nutshell, what is the vulnerable world hy hypothesis? And, you know, and then, then we'll just go into a little bit about, you know, where do we go from here? Sure. Uh, so I got fascinated a number of years ago with Nick Bostrom, who's a very incredible forward thinker, talks about uh, existential risks to the future in AI. And he published uh, what is called the Vulnerable World Thesis. And so I'm a big fan of the singularity and the roadmap to the singularity. Uh, some of the work by, uh, you know, people like Peter Diamandis on uh, abundance. And I believe that the world is moving to an abundant future powered by technology. But what gets missed is the pathway to that point. If it's unevenly distributed and unequally uh, applied, can and most likely will, under the vulnerable world thesis, lead to disaster. And so the basic idea is, um, if you look back at history, there's been a few technologies like nuclear weapons, nuclear power, um, uh, germ warfare, that uh, could have a massive world ending or disruptive uh, threat model. And it's only through the grace of physics and some, you know, kind of mutually assured destruction that we have not had that. If, if you imagine that by in some alternate universe, I could take a bunch of sand, put it in a microwave and turn it into physical material. Um, would we really expect to be here? Do you think we could have survived the last 50 years or 60 years when some aggrieved individual uh, in Africa, suffering from AIDS, who looks at an average lifespan of 30 compared to the world who's living 80, uh, in parts of the Middle East, in parts of, you know, uh, Christian terrorists in, that we've had doing things like the Oklahoma City bombing. If they could have access to that kind of uh, asymmetric weapon of destruction, would society be able to survive? And if you look at our reaction to even something like planes on 9-11 mm -hmm. and the rollback of freedoms and civil liberties, I think we can honestly say no. And what you end up in that model is you end up with a gradual reduction of everyone's freedoms and a tip versus tat, whereby tin pot dictators end up winning. And it's the one world stat that we've actually been falling back on. Average lifespan, uh, you know, health improvements, everything in the world is getting better, which Steven Pinker talks about and Gil Bill Gates talks about, except for one actual, two actual stats, wealth inequality, and the other one is uh, the number of citizens in the world living under dictatorships and non-democratic -dem governments. And that becomes very scary. And e as much as we love to talk about Bitcoin fixes that, hmm. actually kind of doesn't. No. Because even if you had financial sovereignty and someone was using Blockstream satellite and living in North Korea, and they accumulated some Bitcoin using incredible networking technology and went to flee the country because they bought a new house in the U.S., if you don't have support for uh, migration, both climate related migration, if you believe that climate change is real, um, and economic migration, when you have citizens in Venezuela who are robbed of financial sovereignty and living under a dictator, when that person is told, I'm sorry, there's no room for you in the Western world, 
stay where you are. And they try and flee. And some dictator pulls them over and says, okay, give us your Bitcoin wealth or else. We don't even have plausible, deniable cryptography in Bitcoin, which allows you to pretend that you have no coins in your wallet. Uh, mm -hmm. That's work we need to improve. But you know, there's an active threat model that you could be ending up just the way the blood diamonds were used and minerals were used by dictators in Africa. You end up supporting dictatorships and they rob you of your Bitcoin. So uh, Bitcoin alone does not solve this. And the, the idea is one of those citizens will use access to things like CRISPR, synthetic biology, autonomous drones, uh, microscopic drones that can, you know, and they will do some attack. They'll look at a, an aggrieved world and say, oh, you really want to leave me out? Here's hmm. CRISPR-55 yeah. and I'll kill 40 million of you. Yeah. And eventually, and so the solutions that Bostrom proposed were essentially building a global AI that builds global surveillance states. And as we've seen in China with the uh, Muslim and the you know atrocities going on there, when you have surveillance tech being used and accessible and turned against its citizenry, it's horrible. And so this actually weakens Bitcoin overall, because if you have more tin pot dictators, they can do nation state attacks like BGP routing attacks, which Bitcoin has some vulnerabilities to if you are do attacking the internet at the core infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, you can do attacks against citizenry where you're you know, empowering evil dictators to accumulate. And uh, you know, so we need a, an alternative to those. Yeah. And I believe Bitcoin is a core part of that. And so the, part of the idea that I've been playing with is what if instead of having a US backed petrodollar that destroys the environment, that supports dictatorships, which a lot of Bitcoiners understand the cost to that, the cost to the environment, the cost to global civil liberties, that we actually had a Manhattan project around clean energy, life extension technology, singularity tech, and you reversed your foreign policy to be one of the way China is using debt and the, you know, kind of their uh, debt based approach to foreign policy throughout Africa with the Belt Road Initiative and others. What if democratic nations, not only the US, but, you know, as form of G8 countries went and said, you know what, we can totally remake your energy infrastructure, we can help you remake central banking around uh, sound assets, we can help you do economic uh, rebuilding and rebuild your healthcare system. But we need you to agree to a certain set of principles, almost the new version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights around data sovereignty, economic sovereignty, and personal privacy. And you could actually start to remake the world without going in and you know playing the old games of the past where you had the CIA and the KGB fighting over tin pot dictators. You could actually remake around a set of values that out of World War II actually did the world a lot of good, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, Austin, I mean, you're, you're really singing my song here, as I know Michael knows, you know, um, part of my, my role here at the forum is I actually run our entire center for the 4IR, we call it, which basically looks at the convergence <laughs> of technologies and says, we spend too much time looking at technology in isolation because people get kind of in their silo, you know, thinking about things. We have to look at systems and systems change and it has to be values based. It has to be based in principles to what you're saying. Um, we have to recognize that the threat surface is gigantic. And if you're patching a hole over here, to your point about CRISPR, there's a million other options you could have thrown in there, right? There are all kinds okay. of other ways that you can actually create or just shift almost like an amoeba, shift the kind of the, the, the surface and attack from a different from a different place. And so um, I guess the question is, you know, I, I firmly believe personally, um, and the forum, of course, uh, believes that, you know, a global solution is needed, right? You really have to come across together across borders. You have to really think about this. That is incredibly complicated. And as anybody who works even for like a week in governance understands, it's like the most complicated part of all of this is how do you actually create a robust governance that does preserve privacy, that is secure, uh, that accommodates different kinds of different value sets that are somewhat nuanced because they do differ across cultural borders, even if they are grounded, you know, if, even if they're grounded in democratic principles, there's still a lot of detail in there, right, about how you do that. What are your thoughts on this, given what you've all seen? How so I certainly think at a number of levels, government and governance, uh, you know, tends, especially the higher up you go in the hierarchies of government, uh, tend to suffer from regulatory capture and institutional corruption. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the great things about uh, decentralizing technologies is uh, you can look at their power to, you know, and it's never one sided. Twitter is incredible for facilitating social conversations and it gave rise to things like the Arab uprising. 
Um, it's also, you know, some would say Facebook and Twitter and social media have led to the destruction of democracy in some countries. And, you know, so there's never this one-sided, I mean, we, it's funny, we face this at zero knowledge where I used to have this very nuanced conversation with reporters about like, are you afraid that privacy technologies will be used by criminals and child pornographers? And I was like, well, you know, a knife can be used by someone stabbing you or a surgeon. Uh, the car that clips you on crossing the street can just as easily be an ambulance that saves your life. And of course, every article came out saying Austin defends child pornographers. <laughs> and so I had to learn over oh, time. that to, one myself, yeah. <laughs> to keep my answers very simple, like we're so glad our privacy technology protects children. <laughs> from, and that's all the answer I would ever give. So yeah, yeah. nuance is sometimes lost on these, but yeah. imagine some of the work being done at the municipal level, what we're seeing in Miami. What we're seeing, uh, incredible work by Salim Ismail from the Singularity University, who's promoting kind of, because you can remake a city and local governance in a lot of ways that you can't, big federal or state level governance, where you have regulatory capture, you have economic interests. Um, you can start to decentralize the grid when you look at the power of technology. I recently saw a company that uh, is competing with Elon's Boring Company, but they make whole sized drones, autonomous drones that blast through underground mm -hmm. and you can remake an ele electronic rig or an electric grid. So we're seeing it being used on uh, native land and we're trying to pair it with Bitcoin miners and uh, containers to be able mm -hmm. to make in in a totally independent power grid that's totally bypassing the power grids that exist powered by green energy that's self-funding. So you have an opportunity to go in and say, we can do economic development. We can do experiments with things like UBI uh, the same way casino revenue did it for the native population, where you can provide a social safety net at the bottom to deal with some of the issues of the Piketty problem, but still allow for self-sovereignty individual and look at things like reducing tax load. So, you know, there are so many opportunities that get lost in this kind of black, white, government's good, government's bad. You know, you have to be an anarchist or you have to be a socialist or this morality test that somehow like Bitcoin is free money, free money, like the monetary freedom. And this idea that you have to face a religious test or only eat meat to be able to be a Bitcoiner is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, <laughs> you know, uh, I love the idea that we can say, you know, we can approach governance and change using the best parts of technology mm -hmm. for transparent voting, for more right. accountable open source voting machines. And we have to lead that, not frankly, the US has lost a lot of credibility in that, but you could lead that very easily in other countries, like some of the Dutch countries, some of the European nations, and they could come together and say, listen, if you want this, uh, this economic development package that has green tech, that mm -hmm. has advanced technology for life extension, that can save socialized medicine, for those who have socialized medicine that is facing increasing and collapsing costs, we'll give it to you all, but you have to agree on certain data privacy standards that were right. enshrined in some like, like the EU data pr protection. You have to ensure, ensure that you have fair and transparent voting with full accountability. So you can start to remake the systems level approach that you're talking about. And the question is, can we prioritize those technologies that actually reduce threats in the world? Right. While while reducing some of the technologies that accelerate it, yeah, those are a series of choices. It's 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 a massive challenge, and unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to leave it. Uh, I think you guys need to you know get together and 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 sort of lead lead the charge <laughs> in working this out. Well, there's certainly some interesting stuff happening uh, in the way after the Singularity University. All these things, I think, uh, come together in 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 you know a, a very different vision of what the world could look like, and. I'm I'm really looking forward to exploring this. It, it very much uh, fits within the spirit of what we've been trying to do with this podcast: is to think outside the box and just really imagine at a very big scale how the world could be different. Listen, uh, Austin, I, I will this say is this, Michael, just before we leave, a key part of this is Bitcoin. The idea yeah. to protect yourself against monetary debasement is at the heart of so many freedoms. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to shift the world. Moving from, you know, Jeff Booth talks about this, moving from a consumption-based culture that's driven by currency debasement, where you're almost forced to spend your money and support an artificial inflation rate, it affects the environment, it affects the world's health, it affects this constant consumerism. 
Uh, and I think we have a chance through Bitcoin. It will be a key part of the solution. And that's why I, I spend so much time supporting yeah. Bitcoin. We, we definitely need to think about the trade-off between consumption, savings, and, and incentives when it comes to the use of, of resources and, and energy and everything else. And there's loads, loads more we could be talking about. So listen, Austin, look, this has been a joy. You, you, you've, you've sort of given a high bar now for the future uh, yeah, of this right. OG series. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for taking us on your journey from those early days right through to now and then looking into the future as to how we can move is exactly what we wanted to. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as always, Sheila, it was a pleasure. Thank you for all your input and thank you all of you listeners and viewers. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode of Money Reimagined. <laughs>